Hey guys, welcome back to The Better Project. On this episode, we talk to Bradley Driver, who was actually on a similar path to me. We talk about his journey from being a personal trainer, real estate agent, and now having his own podcast. We also talk about how he deals with having cystic fibrosis. I hope you guys really enjoyed this episode. I sure did. I got to say, it's probably one of the top episodes I've done thus far. He's a great bloke. I hope you enjoy it. If you do enjoy it, please remember to like, share, and subscribe. It really helps me out. Cheers, guys. Thanks for coming on and giving me your time. Not a problem at all, mate. Um, you want to quickly introduce yourself, uh, talk about your upbringing and what you do? Yeah, definitely. So my name's Bradley Driver. Um, I guess known as Bradley J. Driver now from the podcast, from the experience. I was um, brought up here in Wollongong, Australia, so just south of Sydney. Love it here. It's um, my best spot in the world as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. But just a really, mate, really sort of loving upbringing have two amazing parents, a younger sister, and just a really close family and sort of really tight knit and just made grew up loving sport and being a really outgoing sort of out there personality and sort of as life progressed, that meant I guess my my jobs and career paths sort of went in that direction, just being outgoing and sort of thing where I was putting myself out there and just reaching new heights with every new role. So i pr- pretty blessed to, to have the upbringing that I've had for sure. Yeah, well, you're not a dragon support, are you? Mate, I'm not. Mate, luckily, <laughs> luckily, I just watched that and I'm like, mate, I'm a chook supporter, so I've had a couple yeah. of really good years. Yeah, lucky. Fuck, I'll go for Tigers. We're hit and miss. Mate, what what happened last night? Was it last night or the night before, buddy? Yeah, against the night. Titans, mate. Bro, it was like last 30 seconds they scored. I was like, fuck. Mate, it's going to, I think, unless you're, I think it's going to be a rough year if you're in one of those, if you're a supporter of one of those sides. The shorter comp doesn't favour those who have yeah. those tough sort of close games all the time. So, yeah. mate, it's, it's, I think it's going to be another good year to be a Chuck supporter. <laughs> yes. So I've been following you for a bit. You're a very uh, outgoing person like compared to myself. I'm naturally shy and introverted. Um, what's your kind of mission and purpose behind what you do? Yeah, it's a good question, man. So I guess... I was sort of, I know it'll probably come up later in the potty, so I don't want to jump to um, jump to it too quickly, but I, I guess I was presented with some health hurdles as a, as a younger lad and it, um, it probably, it, it never stopped me from doing the things that I wanted to achieve, but it probably made me more aware of how important it was to make the most of life and do the things that I really loved. And my family was always really supportive of anything I wanted to do and I guess that just led to when you when you have great support network around you, it builds amazing self confidence. I think, and I just sort of never doubted who I was as a person. And I was always I was sort of the guy at three four years old running up to people at the park asking to jump in for a game of footy or cricket, and just really from there just built a knack for making relationship building really easy and creating new relationships. And that led to. Man, my first career in in PT as a 16-year-old guy that left school and became a personal trainer and had, you know, young clients, clients in in their 80s. Um, So I learned to talk to so many people of different ages. And then from there, I got into real estate. And funnily enough, at the time, I thought real estate was going to be the be-all, end-all, like, you know, nice, nice clothes, selling nice houses, It felt like a career at the time, Um, but it just helped me build a lot of relationships and and get really good at, I guess, understanding people. And once I understood people, I felt like I understood myself a little better and I really worked on sort of being more self-aware the back end of last year. And I sat down and I I had a bit of a, a rough episode for probably a fortnight, a month last year through, I think it was October where I had a bit of a hiccup in my health and I, um, man, I was sitting in hospital for that two weeks and I realized how stressed I'd been. Like I wasn't, I hadn't been enjoying my life. I hadn't been doing the things that had made me the person that I was leading up to that last sort of two, three years. And I sort of sat there and I thought, man, I'm on the wrong path. Like I'm not, I'm not aligned with what my end purpose will be. And I knew my purpose was always to share stories and connect with people on a bigger level and a bigger platform. Um, so that sort of led to starting the podcast in, I think it was Feb, like the idea come around in Jan and then in Feb I launched 
Yeah. And then 25 episodes deep and I feel like I'm on the right track to get to where I want to be. And I think it's you just got to be so self-aware of whether or not you're actually in line with what you're trying to achieve because mm. it's easy to get caught up with all the shit in between. Yeah, exactly. And that's probably what I've done for three years. Yeah. So I guess overall, to answer your question properly, overall purpose is, man, I love this. I love sharing stories. I love connecting with people and I'd love to be in a position um, where I have a platform that can reach the world and I get to connect with those people like your Rogans, your Aubrey Marcus, um, you know, high level athletes and entertainers and just share my story as well as theirs. Yeah. So talk to me about your health issues. So it's cystic fibrosis. Yeah. So it's, it's funny, man, because it's, I, I think as far as genetic illnesses go in Australia, I think it's the most, it's one of the most common, if not the most common in, in young kids. And with that, it's quite shocking because not a lot of people know about it. So yeah, I if I said to most people, yeah, cystic fibrosis, not many people know what it is. Um, and it's like, it's a hard one to understand because I guess I can talk about, I can talk about it. And then most people see me and that's their reflection or understanding of it mm. where I'm probably in that 5% that aren't suffering. Um, and then there's a whole other 95% of the equation that really struggle day to day. But I guess to, to simply break it down without going full doctor on everyone, it's a, um, it's a condition that Basically, you're missing a salt gene in your body that transports salt and water to the organs. Yeah. And basically, it means damage in the lungs, the liver, the spleen, and digestive system. So I take roughly sort of 50 tablets a day, every day. Um, yeah, so I'm a bit of a walking chemist, mate. If, I, if you shook <laughs> me, I'd rattle a little bit. But yeah. that becomes second nature very quickly. I've been doing that my whole life. Um, and I just keep on top of it with a few other things. And mate, pretty much just like anyone would trying to keep really healthy and trying to keep on top of my health. And as long as that's a priority, um, I should be sweet. But, you know, I've, because of the liver disease as well that comes with it, it means I can't drink. So I'm a sober man always, which means Sunday mornings are really easy. <laughs> yeah, um, so I don't drink myself. Well, there you go. It's, it's one of those things, mate, where I feel like if you're negative about it, you're not going to get anything from it. Yeah, And that's just... Like I said before, like my upbringing, I was blessed with an amazing family that were, were so positive about what I could achieve or what I could have in my life that it was never a, a second question on whether um, I was going to have healthy, um, good opportunities as a young adult yeah. where, you know, for, for most people, the sad reality of cystic fibrosis is a life expectancy of about 40 um, here in Australia. Um, so, you know, it is pretty serious. And like I said, I've had my, my hurdles here and there, little hiccups where you spend two or three weeks in hospital and, um, you know, a little bit of recovering, but it's been nothing that, you know, I've been able to walk out of hospital and go back to training the next day or you know, go back to, to running around and keeping active where for a lot of people, unfortunately, it's probably six to nine months a year that they spend in hospital. Yeah. Um, so mate, I'm, I'm a fortunate guy with cystic fibrosis, but I think a lot of it comes down to a really active and conscious lifestyle that, that has allowed me to be the way that I am now. So I guess that's what I try to push to anyone with CF. You know, you'd never recommend anything that, that doctors wouldn't, but I would just say, mate, like anyone in life, the healthier you are and the more you look after yourself, the better chance you have. Yeah. So playing sport as you were growing up, did that have much of an impact on you, not being able to kind of perform? Mate, that's a great question. No, no one ever asked that, right? And that's actually a really good question because it never affected me performing at a higher level. So I was a state champion sprinter as a kid. Yeah. And, mate, I lived for footy. Like, footy was my life growing up. Yeah. And I'd like to, I'd like to say I was good at it. <laughs> um, the only thing that stopped me doing, because I had liver disease, my liver grew a little bit too much. It filled up too much, with too much blood and was quite scarred and damaged, yeah. which meant that, I guess if you if you go full human anatomy on everyone, your liver and your, and your spleen for that matter, and pretty much most vital organs sit underneath the protection of your rib cage. Mm -hmm. um, for me, my liver hangs slightly below it. Uh, so the issue was they said at a young age, mate, if you take a hit too hard or if you get clocked in the liver, it could rupture. And obviously if your liver ruptures and you don't get to the hospital quick enough, 
it's um, it's game over. So they said, mate, it's probably best you quit contact sport, which killed me at the time. Mate, it was probably, the, it was probably to be honest, the saddest thing that had ever happened in my life at that age. Yeah. Being How old were you? Taken away you from, stopped? Mate, I was nine. I, okay. So I, think I was probably 10 when I had to stop league. I ended up getting a few cheeky years under the belt again in high school because <laughs> I just couldn't watch the boys play and sit on the sideline. Yeah. But we used to, we actually used to run. My old boy was a school footy coach. Yeah. So we used to um we used to get like almost like a gym mat and I used to wrap it around my stomach and tape it. <laughs> and I couldn't breathe for the whole game because it was so tight. Yeah. But it was just like if I got clocked, it was a little bit of extra protection for my liver. So I'd done whatever I could to play. But as you get older, as you know, man, yeah. I'm 24 now, you know, you probably can't get away with rubbing a mat around your stomach yeah. and, and running out there for a game. So it's sort of, it's, that's the only way it really affected me. Aside from that, man, I competed at the highest levels in most sports that I played. And I, I lived, for, like I said, I lived for sport growing up as, as a young fella. So I was, it was probably the reason I'm as healthy as I am now because I've done it seven days a week. Yeah, so you said you were a sprinter. What's the fastest time you ran? Man, that's a really good... Someone asked me that the other day, actually, because I was, I was at a run club on Sunday morning. We are talking about it, and I was like, oh, it's been a few years since I've put on the runners and had a run. <laughs> but I can't, I can't remember. I just remember being like probably any, from any age from six till about 12. Yeah. I was just highly competitive, and I used to you know, win or place most years at state and... Just to, I think sprinting such like it's such an individual sport mm. that you just get sick of it. Like yeah. unless it's going to be your career or something you continue to pursue and like do really well at, it's hard, man, to go down to the track four days a week and yeah. run by yourself. Yeah, you see, some you feel of those, terrible uh, at the end Olympians, of every session. Fuck, they train. Yeah, a hundred percent, man. So many times a day, and it's like shit. I guess it's, it's a very lonely sport. Medal. A hundred percent. And it's, it's just a lonely sport. Yeah. And I, did, I, I was probably never good enough to go and compete nationally or, you know, do it for a living. I was definitely not good enough to do that. So for me, it was just like, it's more of a hobby than anything now. Yeah. So take me back to your real estate. What's it like being a, you know, a young, confident kid? Like how did the older guys kind of treat you? Yeah, no, man, another really good question. So I come, I come into the industry, I went into the industry, past tense now, at, um, at 20 years of age. And sort of at the time, it was, it was funny because I'd just come out of the fitness industry and I was looking for something that fitness is so inconsistent. Like mm. um, unless you're really a, a social profile, it's hard to make really good money. Yeah. And I thought I want a career that I can make good money in but also – something that has consistency and I feel like I can develop myself at. And so real estate, you know, I could talk, you know, I, lo- I love houses, I love people. So I thought it makes sense. I went into the business, like I said, at 20 years of age, knowing not a thing. Like I breezed through the the registration course because that's really easy. That's why there's so many bloody real estate agents <laughs> these days. Um, and I found myself in that job and I sort of, I was blessed that I got given a position to, I guess work as almost like a junior agent as opposed to an assistant. So I was on the ground a lot at meetings, at open houses, like watching what the older guys did. And my theory at the time was I'll never never know as much as these guys right now. So I've just got to look better than every one of them. (laughs) So I used to rock up like full kit, like I'm talking suit, tie, pocket square, the hair was done. I looked so greasy, man. I was probably the greasiest looking 20 year old, yeah. but just under it all, I had a good heart and good intentions. And I sort of built really good relationships in that first year. And probably after six months when I first, when I done my first deal, like individually, I started selling and listing a bit of property myself and then an opportunity to move to Melbourne and work for sort of a quite nationally recognized brand that was really different and bold and out there and sort of outspoken in the industry they approached me through sort of a bit of social um, collaboration and then watching my stuff and me being involved in their stuff. And then a few conversations and a week spent down there with those guys led to an opportunity. So I moved and I spent it, I spent nine months, I think in Melbourne. Yeah. And man, I, like all I done was work like 12 hours a day, seven days a week. And I just lost, I lost all excitement and passion for it there. And 
I'm a real close family man, so yeah. it killed me being away from the family. Yeah. And felt like I was getting a bit of a sloppy rig because I was never training and I was, you know what <laughs> I mean? I was just locked in, 100%, just locked inside of an office pumping six coffees a day to stay awake. Yeah. And I decided to move back. And with moving back, I felt like I'd gained so much experience and knowledge in Melbourne. And I had some, I felt like for the first time, like I had something to offer to the industry. And I didn't feel that before. I felt like I was always chasing or catching up. And for the first time, I felt like I could really come back and dictate how I done business and, and make a name for myself for being different, being myself. Yep. And so I come back and I vowed never to wear a suit and tie again um, and just come back and was just completely me. And I had a really, it was a real tough slog the first six months. Like I probably underestimated how many people would have forgotten about me mm. when I left. And whilst the industry knew about my time in Melbourne, like, because it was probably closely followed due to the company I was in, the the market didn't. Yeah. <laughs> so it took six months of just really being myself and getting knocked back a whole heap of times and not getting opportunity to then all of us, it felt, man, it felt like it happened overnight, like the click of the fingers and opportunity started rolling in and it was just really off the back of months of hard work and I started to get one opportunity that, I'd succeed at that maybe someone else had failed at, which led to another and started to build a little bit of a name for myself for being just a, tr- a true individual and really being myself. Cause I, especially cause I've got tattoos and I wasn't yeah. wearing a suit and I'm young and you know, I'm a little bit outspoken on social as far as I guess, like I'm, I'm not like a typical sort of watch what you say, be careful, yeah. cater to everyone, real yeah, estate agent. Up, yeah. Yeah, so it sort of it started to pick up though, and I had a really good man. I, ha- I had a good year after that first six months, like a good twelve months, especially the back half of that. I just felt like I couldn't step a foot wrong, and like I was getting more business than ever, and the deals felt easier. Like I was getting some really good turnover, but like I said, it just didn't feel right, and I was I was lying to myself, and I was finding it really hard to. Because for me, the intention was always to do absolutely everything I could for every client. It meant that when you're out of love with it and there's no passion anymore and you're sitting up on the lounge at 11 o'clock on a Sunday night and an email or a text comes through, you feel obligated. Yeah. And I just felt like without the passion, I couldn't escape mm. the, the sort of the frustration of it. And it just started to wear me down, man. And I knew eventually that I wanted to go out with a great reputation intact the right way. And so I made that decision and man, I haven't looked back to be honest. Like, you know, I miss, I miss my work crew and I love the people that I worked with, but I've, I definitely feel like I'm on the right path. It's been a massive financial sacrifice. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's the right thing to do in the long run. Yeah. So do you think uh, being personal trainer and real estate agent has really helped you transition to say the podcast world? A hundred percent because it all, it's funny. I still remember with the transition from PT to real estate, I was like, this is just like getting new clients at the gym. Like yeah. you create a relationship with someone, you make them feel comfortable. And I was not the best personal trainer in the world. But if I felt right for that person, then I was the person they were going to train with. It was the same in real estate and, you know, coming across to the podcast world, like I'm 25 episodes in now and I've got, you know, two more coming through this week. It tends to be two a week at the moment. And I've probably had some names on there that really at this stage in my, in the journey, I probably don't deserve to have. Like I don't have a huge social following. And some of these guys have got 20,000 followers on social. I've got 1,600. Um, I know a lot of people locally, but I don't know celebrities. I don't know professional athletes. So for me, it was just, okay, well, what did I do in real estate? And I I was just myself. So I started video DMing everyone and just creating a relationship off the bat, even if it's through messages. And that's led to me being able to have some pretty cool characters on, you know, in this first three, four months. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. We started, I started what? December, January, my own podcast. Yep. So we've we've started at the same time. Um, yeah. What actually made you want to pursue podcasting? Yeah, for me, it was probably, 
I always really enjoyed, I was all, okay. So I was always a fan of big personalities or athletes. And I remember my, my favorites were not necessarily always the best player or the best personality or the most popular personality, but the people that put content out to the world. Cause I felt like yeah. I could follow them outside of their given talent or what they did every day. And I sort of started to watch how a lot of these people done it. And, you know, I guess to be super successful on YouTube, you kind of got, it seems as though you got to have a few Lamborghinis and party houses. <laughs> and I was like, so it's probably not going to be YouTube videos, but mm. I've always just thought if I had a really, I'm, I'm a really social guy. So I go for a lot of coffee, catch ups and walks and chats with people yep. during the week. And there's plenty of conversations that I would come out of like feeling really charged off, like thinking, fuck, that's put me in a really good headspace or I feel yeah. really positive about that. And just realize conversation is powerful. It can change people's lives. And mm. I'd done a real estate podcast for about two months with a mate and that helped me understand the tech side of it. And that was probably the thing scaring me away is like, I'm, man, I'm shit house with tech. Yeah. So just before we jumped on here, I was trying to connect my AirPods to the, the MacBook and I'm like, I've given up. Um, so for me, once I got the hang of the tech, I was like, I'm going to be sweet with this because the rest of it just comes natural to me. So yeah. I jumped in and, and what, like, yeah, you have, your, you have a few hiccups along the way. Like you probably know your first few episodes, you're stressing over yeah. everything, man. You're exactly. like, is it recording properly? Is it <laughs> sounding good? Is it clear? Did, am I doing this right? Yeah. But once you get over that first few and you get comfortable, for me, man, I get the most joy waking up in the morning knowing that I'm shooting an episode. Like I'm stoked because tomorrow and Wednesday I'll shoot two great episodes and like I'll feel great about that for the rest of the yeah. week. So it's it's just such a good feeling. Yeah. The best is when um you get messages from people and they're like, Oh, you've inspired me to do more of your life and stuff. And I was like, A hundred percent, man. I was I was only so saying good. I was saying to a mate this morning actually, I was saying I got a message from a guy on, on Saturday night, like two o'clock mm. and he's like, Hey mate, don't know you, but I've been listening to the podcast. Absolutely loving it. Thanks for putting out great content for me, man. That's, that means more than any of the other shit, like a big commission come th coming through or, um, you know what I mean? Or having success or like looking good on social for me to, to, to feel like you're, and I still remember getting the first messages like that after episode two, where I had done a chat on mental health with a, a non-for-profit organization here in, in the Illawarra. And mate, I was like, fuck, that's an infectious feeling. That's something I can really get used to. And I know, I, you know, we've both had ice on our potties. Um, he talks about it a lot, that feeling of helping people. It's, it's just something that's hard to, to not want. You know what I mean? So I look yeah. forward to those messages coming through and, for me now, they're my commissions. Yeah. So, yeah, I jumped on my mate's podcast today and he messaged me two weeks ago saying, wow, you've inspired me. I'm going to start my own podcast. And I was like, shit. That's great. Yeah. And so I went on his. This is a good feeling. It makes you feel good that you can make a change in someone's life. A hundred percent, man. And I think, you know, it's it's one of those things where everyone's at a different stage and like – there's certain people, and, and this is the thing that I love about it. You know, people say, what's the motivation for you to grow the podcast at scale? Of course, we all want to make more money and we all want to be financially free and yeah. have the luxuries and successes that, that come along with having a big platform. But what if one of those messages feels good, imagine what a thousand of them feels like. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? To know that you're having real global... Um, like that, that you're making change globally and that you, you're truly affecting people on a larger scale, that excites the hell out of me. So that's why I keep grinding towards getting those bigger names on, getting the bigger audiences and may hopefully one day Rogan's coming on my podcast <laughs> or he's asking me to go on his. Yeah, that would be good, eh? Fuck, he's so 100 mil would be nice too. Yeah, oh yeah, fuck off. <laughs> so you're pursuing podcasting full-time now. How does that impact you financially? massively so to be honest like i'm pretty open with my finances man because i feel like you know i'm not i'm no lebron james or anything like yeah. the no one's going to come rob my house I've, i don't have that much money so it's not like i have to be quiet about it but yeah. i was pretty i was pretty comfortable in real estate so i was making like minimum 64 grand on a base wage so you know even if i wasn't 
even if I had like a bad year or next year turned out to be a terrible year, um, I had a pretty secure income and, you know, I was a single guy who has, you know, I've only got a small mortgage. It's, it's not, it's really manageable. You know, 64 grand is really comfortable. You can do what you want to do. You can go on a holiday every year and, you know what I mean, you can go out for brekkie and lunch every day and not stress. Yeah. Um, for me now, I've probably lost, I probably walked away from 150 grand next year. Um, just the way that my wage and financial situation was set up at work. I, I could have replicated what I'd done this year or very close to and probably made about 150 grand because of the way that a credit debit system works in real estate. Um, but to be honest, not once in making the decision to leave was that stopping me, if you know what I mean. And I think when there's money in front of you or money presents itself and it doesn't phase you, I think you know you're on the right track. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, okay, if I, if I keep doing what I'm doing, I'm probably going to spend more money anyways because I'm trying to satisfy myself through going out for lunch, going out for dinner, spending money on this, buying something new because I'm not happy doing what I'm doing. Yeah. Where man, to live the lifestyle I live now, I have one or two coffees a day. I walk around, I podcast, I eat my food from home as much as I can. I don't need as much money to live and I'm trying to live a little more humbly and level myself a bit yeah. um, to pursue this. And I'm sort of, I, I did have an ad contract, which gave me some money through a few of those podcast episodes, which sort of got hammered during COVID that that business lost a lot of their contracts and their money. But I'm on the process of sort of getting that back and because I love presenting and um, being face to face with an audience live as well, I'll probably go back to doing maybe one or two days of auctioneering if I can pick up a gig or emceeing events or weddings or whatever, man. Like I just love that thrill of being in front of a group of people and having to perform. Yeah. So for me, I'll probably be able to make a bit of money through that. But eventually the goal is the podcast monetizes and or I have some sort of platform where I'm doing this, whether it be video, TV, whatever it may be, um, that becomes the end goal. That'd be nice. Yeah. So you're just living off savings at the moment or? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> pretty much. Which isn't too, to be honest, it's not too bad. I think you just, you just got to become more humble. Gary V yeah. talks about it all the time. You know, if, you, if you're happy, live the $30,000 lifestyle as opposed to the $60,000, $80,000 lifestyle where you yeah. feel like shit every day. Yeah, it's like you only need so much, man. Yeah, I spend fucking shit all. I put all my money into savings and buy that's tech, good, man. Tech gear for the podcast. Is how old are you now? 23. Yeah, you're similar age to me. I'm 24. So, yeah, I feel like, and this is the time to do it. Exactly. The thing is, people say, Oh, yeah, you're young, just keep working hard and saving money. I'm like, But when are you going to do it? Are you going to quit yeah. your job when you're 30 and you got a kid and a massive mortgage and life yeah. stressful and your missus are saying, why have you quit your job? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that's not the time to do it. I think now there's no, you know, there's no children that are expecting me to come home and feed them. I live a pretty, like, like you said, a pretty low key lifestyle where I'm not spending silly money. I don't drink. So, you know, I don't get on the drugs. Like I'm, I'm a pretty, to be honest, dude, like I'm, I'm a pretty cheap date. Like yeah. put a water in front of me and I'm a happy man. <laughs> so, and, and a coffee for me is my luxury. So it's, oh, I, I can bear it and I just got to be patient and I definitely don't want to get to the point where I guess that's why I'm looking to do a bit of auctioneering and stuff too and event hosting is I don't want to, I think when you become vulnerable for money and you lose the patience, yeah. you start to, you start to do things that aren't in the best interest of the project that you're pursuing. So I never want my podcast to be something that makes me a quick $200 if it loses the quality for the viewers. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like so, this, this time of life is meant to, you know, experience life, try new shit. But so many people 100%. expect you to have your shit together. And I'm like, fuck, I'm young. I'm only 23. Like, come on. But that's why everyone's so unhappy in their 50s. Exactly. You know what I mean? Because everyone, do, everyone does the same thing. They leave school. They're expected to go to TAFE or university and get a degree or a trade. They do it. And then they're supposed to stay in it for the rest of their lives. How the fuck can someone at 21 or 18 know what they want to do for the rest of their lives. Yeah, they don't even know. And I've changed really. three times in about five years. Mm. Yeah. I was at so, uni last year and I dropped out. Yeah. And, mate, and everyone would say you're crazy, right? Yeah. Like, what are you doing, mate? I got it too. I know exactly what you mean. 
Yeah. But at the moment, because my family have their own business, so I'm working in that at the moment for cash. Um, That's in aircon, yeah? Yeah, aircon. And I'll, yep. like me and my brother will take it over one day, but it's, it's not my passion, but I want to build it to a point where I don't have to work in the business. I can just overlook it and yeah, focus it's great. on my passions. Yeah. Is this for you the passion? Like, is this what you love or is this just a way to connect with people? Um, for me, it's it's become a passion because like me being naturally introverted, I'm doing it to kind of grow as a person and connect with people because growing up yeah. I was very shy. I never really talked to people. So for me, it's about personal development as well as, you know, I believe everyone has a story. So I want to share as many people's stories as possible. Yeah. So that's awesome. As long as it helps. Bro, I just realized you've got yeah. some gear too. Yeah. Fuck. Spend some money. eh? Bro, like even the shirts, I gotta level my game up. <laughs> Bro, I'm sitting over in a white t-shirt. What's going on? Yeah, it's fucking, it's all right. So you're not getting paid for podcasts. Who are your who are your top three guests you've had so far? Oh, bro, that's a good question. Hey, um, <sighs> that's a good. Put me on the spot. Fuck, I hope they all don't listen to this. I know um, that would be ice. Ice, ice for sure, because for me, he was someone that, to, to be honest, that that guy as a, as a human being, I think, yeah, he's great, he's entertaining, he's, you know, doing so many cool things, but outside of that, he's just a good guy that wants to help people, and he, you know, he was someone that I lent on for advice and set him one up and, you know, would consistently message and annoy the fuck yeah. out of probably on many occasions to to help understand if i was on the right path so he's definitely someone i looked up to so it was a nice moment to have him on mine and to be able to share that platform with him um another one would definitely be joe damon um the the kiwi comedian he's a very funny guy i feel like he's he's one guy as well i say to people all the time i can't i can't commend that guy as a human being enough he's just as funny as he is and it as much as everyone loves him for a laugh and, you know, we still have a bit of banter here and there. He's just a good guy, mate. He's gone out of his way to be supportive of my show so many times, sharing it around, trying to spread the message. Like he jumped on one of my Instagram lives. I done like a Friday night live a month yeah. back and he jumped on for 15 minutes and just talked a heap of shit and made people laugh. And he's just a good human being. And it's, it's actually been really exciting for me sort of post my podcast because we we done that right at the start of the sort of COVID lockdown especially for them in NZ they'd only been in lockdown for a week and man like he was he was doing well but he was putting out so much content and like I'm talking a lot of good quality content yeah and sort of probably a week or two after my podcast I noticed definitely not because of me but just because of everything he'd, he'd done had been compounding and getting in, in front of people, mate, he just, he just blew up. He's gone up about nearly 10,000 followers Shit. in the space of like eight weeks. And he's on massive podcasts now, massive shows. I'm lucky I got him when I did, to be honest. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's exciting to see that guy have great success because he deserves it, you know. He's a young guy like us. He's only 24. Mm. So he deserves all the success in the world, man. So he'd be up there. And then third... Third, I'll throw a, I'll throw a spinner in the works here, a really different one, but I've had some amazing ones, but the most popular episode for me thus far, listen-wise, and probably the one where I feel like I, I gave it the most justice as a host was episode 24, which was, um, which was a mate of mine, Jared Peascutt, who spoke really openly and courageously about his battle with bipolar and and clinical depression. And mate, it was an episode for me that I really wanted to do justice, not just because he was a friend, but it's a very, very sensitive topic. And mate, the amount of, I think he had 50, 60 messages post that episode, you know, people commending him on the way he spoke. And I felt like I gave him a, a really nice and comfortable platform to share his story, which has undoubted, undoubtedly helped others. We both had people reach out who were quite emotional, so that you know, they had tears throughout the episode. Yeah. And um, for me, that's a that's a really nice feeling because it is helping people 
you know, we want to inspire people, but if you can put someone in a really good headspace to maybe go and see someone professionally or, um, you know, steer away from doing something that, that could end their life, um, man, that's a great feeling. Mm. So what would be probably the best thing or piece of advice you've received from one of your guests so far? Bro, you've you've nailing these questions, I tell you. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't even say piece of advice. I think what I've learned, what I've learned, man, from from all these guests, and just even from the last couple of years of my life, is just to not doubt who you are as a person. Yeah. You know, I think behind everyone's story, you know, it's it's easy to see anyone and think there's an overnight success story there. Um, the truth of the matter is, there never is. Yeah. You know, even even if it's something that becomes overnight success like even if it's a a part of their career that becomes overnight success or becomes recognized you know in in a short space of time I think there's years of hard work and dedication behind that and man with with hard years of hard work and dedication comes hard years of you know doubt from from other people and man I know now I'm I'm blessed I've had one person put hate on me in, in 24 years, yeah, that. um, which you would have seen. Yeah. I was, and, and to be honest, man, I'm fine with it. Cause I don't, for a second, I don't buy into any of that. I know who I am. The people that I love and care about know who I am. And it just taught me, man, that there's going to be 30,000 of those if I want to get to the place that, you know, that I desire. Yeah. And I, I think what I've learned from everyone is just never doubt yourself. If you know, you've got something special and you know, you're, you've got the right intentions in life just keep pushing forward in the right direction. Mm, yeah. I believe if you're, you're receiving hate, you're doing the right shit. Mate, a hundred percent. And, and I can understand it. I've got, you know, what another, another Gary V ice thing is that empathy towards the yeah. people that push hate on you. And mate, I, I get it. I'm 24. I had a little bit of success in my past career and I've quit my job to pursue a podcast because I have the luxury of doing it. Yeah. Cause I'm humble about the way that I live. You know, I'm in a good position financially to do that. And mate, for someone who's sitting there and probably hates their job Monday to Friday or Monday to Saturday and lives for their Sundays, mm. of, of course there's some sort of jealousy or animosity. Yeah. Um, and that's unfortunate from their end, but mate, you know, if I, if I was hating what, you know, I, I'd be lying if I said I didn't sit in Melbourne at times and think, fuck, like I wish I was back doing what I was doing before. I wish I was back with my mates living the life that they're living now. So, you know, we all go through tough times. I think it's just important that people don't project it on others or the world. Exactly. Um, definitely talk to people and, and get it off your chest and try to become a better person. But I just think I've just learned maybe not everyone's as self-aware as I am. <laughs> mm-hmm. So besides Joe Rogan, what's an, who's another person you'd love to have on the show? Um, okay. So there's probably, I asked the question to a few people the other day, if you could have three people over for dinner yep. from anywhere in the world at, at, in, in this given time, who would they be? Um, mate, I'm a massive Leo DiCaprio fan. I think that guy is sensational as far as actors goes. And obviously yep. a person who's got a lot more than just acting talent, but is a very intelligent guy too. So I'm going to give you three, man, cause I can't narrow it down to one. Um, yep. Probably a guy then like probably Ricky Gervais. I think he's the funniest man on the planet. Um, yep. I, I absolutely love that guy. I live for his stuff, for his comedy. And the third would probably be maybe at this point in time, someone like LeBron James, um, just a highly sort of a highly talented athlete who's got amazing character and culture and a lot of self-belief and, and self-awareness and, Man, I, I just love those sort of gravitating characters that that we all want to see a little bit more of and get to know a little better. So that they'd probably be my three. Yeah, I'd love to have Gary V on mine. Oh, I mean, Gary V is another guy. He's just he's next level. Man, he's almost like oh, I think he's the he's the superstar of the future. Yeah, average guy who's not an athlete who's come from nothing and has created. I don't even think it's his business. I don't think people even sometimes recognize how successful that guy is in business. Yeah, I know. I think it's just the fact that he's so, he he has so much self-belief and 
is he feels like it's attainable. Yeah. You know what I mean? He's not a guy that was blessed with money. He's not one of those guys, like he's not an Instagram model. You know what I mean? Yeah. Everything he has come from hard work. So I think that's why he's such a likable character. Mm -hmm. So what's the big goal for you? Yeah, I talked about this a lot lately. Um, For me personally, obviously I want the podcast. I think the podcast will always be there. Um, I think it'll be here for the next couple of years in 10 years time. I hope it's still a platform that I get to share stories on and express what's happening in my life. But I think as far as the the greater goal, I think it's got something more to do with me having my own show in, in a video sense. And I just don't know. I, if, if you were asking me that question in 2015, 2016, yeah. my answer would have been that in a TV sense, if you know what I mean. But I just think the way the world's going, it tends to, it's heading in sort of a more streaming service way, like a Netflix yeah. or a Stan or maybe even YouTube. Like there's, there's every possibility that in the next three to five years, YouTube will be like the number one video yeah. platform in terms of people consuming their daily video intake. So I don't know whether it's a show on one of those platforms or not, but I guess it's definitely the the caliber of guests and that's no disregard to anyone I've had on, but just the caliber of guests that will allow me to communicate with the rest of the world will be at a much higher level. So man, I'd love to have all the A-listers and top athletes and those sort of people who can share their stories and really inspire people. Um, I just love this, man. Like yeah. I think conversation never gets boring if you're speaking to the right people. Yeah, so is that your driving factor, being able to you know, network and communicate? communicate with people yeah you know what i love I, I i don't know if you've ever followed aubrey marcus i've heard of him yeah yeah so he's he's joe rogan's business partner in on it and aubrey's got a great podcast and he is a really clued on guy um and i sort of watched him and lewis Howes and a heap of other guys they connected at the start of the year i think it was january for a wim hof event yeah, yeah i seen and that. you seen that yeah yeah and there was probably like 15 or 13 super influential human beings in the same room experiencing a week together or getting better. And I was like, fuck, how, how good's that? Like yeah. imagine being invited into that room and that I don't mean that for clout or for fame or, um, you know, people trying to, you know, trying to get a better profile. So people think, you know, I'm, I'm interesting or they want to follow me. It's just from a personal level of personal development to be in a room with 15 high achievers who are also very self-aware and want to improve as people, May I, that like that excites the hell out of me. So I'd love to be in those positions. At the moment, they don't know who I am though. So <laughs> well, I've, mess- bro, I've messaged them all on Instagram though. Oh, really? Mate, I've messaged Ellen DeGeneres like with a video message like, hey, Ellen, come on the podcast. <laughs> I've messaged LeBron. I've messaged Lewis Howes, Joe Rogan. Mate, one day one of those people will open up that message and just think, this guy's got some guts and some balls to message yeah. us. So I'm That's like, sick. bro, you just got to keep reaching out. Yeah. So besides podcasting, what do you like to do? Mate, I'm a, I guess COVID's, you know, COVID's been really good for me. Yeah. As selfish as that sounds, maybe to some people, it just reignited my passion with exercise and, and health. So for me, like I'm, I'm a 5 a.m. riser at the moment. Yep. for the last couple of weeks and I get up and I'm a really social person. So every morning I go for a coffee and a walk with a couple of mates and mate, I love my coffees. I'm a bit of a coffee fiend. Um, anyone who follows me on IG would know that. Yep. Um, so I, I love going for a coffee and, and being social, but I just really enjoy training and, and keeping fit and healthy at the moment and being in the ocean. I swim some laps every day in the ocean, even during winter. It just makes me feel good and yep. just spending time with family and friends, man. I'm, you know, I enjoy my sport and I enjoy this sort of stuff. But I think more than anything, just being a social human being with the right people. I'm very, I know a lot of people, but I'm very selective with my friends because I want my circle or the people I spend a lot of my time with to be positive influences. And um, so I'm super close to my family too. So I'm, I'm a pretty simple guy, man. Yeah. So Nothing too extravagant. Yeah. So talk to me about the hair. What made you want to do all that? Right. <laughs> the hair's been a journey, man. It's been, it started, it's probably two episodes into the last dance, three episodes into the last dance, the MJ documentary and knew who Dennis Rodman was, you know, prior to that, but 
I never really knew the guy's character. I just knew the name and who he was and what he'd done. And I'm watching this thing and, man, like my focus went from Michael Jordan to who's this character who doesn't give a fuck what anyone thinks and is so confident in himself that he'll do whatever he wants. And, man, I was intrigued, like I was hooked in. And so I thought about it and I was like, you know, it's important for me to engage as big an audience as possible for the podcast. So what if I put a challenge out there that if I get 3,000 subscribers by the end of May, so I'll give people a full month to to push me to that level, yeah. I'll dye my hair leopard print. Now, I'd never dyed my hair. Um, it was just a pretty basic brown haircut, I guess, you know, fade every now and then. Yeah. But I was like, man, something, people like seeing other people get the piss taken out of them. <laughs> so I was like, maybe that'll motivate people to to share the podcast around and subscribe it. And I was like, it'd be a cool challenge just to dye the whole back and sides of my hair leopard print. And I'll say that I rock it for two weeks and then I'll just get it shaved off. Yeah. And I had heaps of people call me out like, man, you'll get close to 3,000 subscribers and you just won't do it. Like you'll get to like two and a half thousand and you'll just pull out. Yeah. And I was like, fuck, don't doubt me. So I just called my barber who I'm mates with and I was like, hey, bro, like if I come through in a week, can you just dye the whole back and sides of my hair leopard print? And he was like, are you sure? And I was like, yeah. So we sat down and we'd done it and then we took a photo. And we, I didn't really tell anyone because I wanted it to be a shock. Yeah. And I just sort of put it out and then I said, you know, everyone doubted me. Like, mm. I'll, I'll do it. Like, I'm, I've got the balls to do it. And, man, it, it blew up. It served its purpose because I had... Like you couldn't miss it. I would walk down. Like if anyone knows Wollongong, where are you from? Uh, Blue Mountains. Blue Mountains. So do you, you'd probably know Wollongong. I don't know if you've been here much. Yeah, I've been there a few times. Yeah, but like especially during COVID, everyone's been walking down at the beach. Yeah. Like along the main strip there in the harbour. So I walk along there every day for about two hours. <laughs> and man, I reckon I had in the space of a month a hundred people come up to me that I didn't know. And asked me like, fuck, that's pretty cool. Like, what'd you do that with your hair for? Or like, what's the story there? Which my answer was always like, oh, it was a p- bit of a publicity stunt for my podcast inspired by Dennis Rodman. And people go, oh, you got a podcast? What's your podcast? So for me, it was like, it was great because it started a heap of random conversations with people yeah. that didn't know who I was and what I'd done. So it was, it was a way of getting it out there. And man, it almost become a part of my identity. So Hey, some of my mates started calling me the big cat, um, whether they were taking the piss or not, or they thought it was funny. I was like, whatever. So that kind of just become, you, you know, man, like it's where, when you get that and you can see the results and the exposure you're yeah. getting, you kind of like, fuck, how long can I play this out for? So I, um, I ended up getting it done like a whiter color at the back and went snow leopard for another two weeks. Yep. And then a few people said, go full slim shady. So <laughs> here we are. Did it grow your channel, having your hair like that? It did. It did. And it just sort of, it was funny because a couple of like, a couple of my mates go to different barbers than I do and they were like, fuck, the, my barber was talking this morning about the guy that got his hair dyed leopard print out in Shaw Harbour at Blend's Barber Shop the other week. And I was like, fuck, are you serious? And he goes, fuck, that's my mate. And I just sort of got it out there and they're like, oh, I used to be a real estate agent. Now he does a podcast. So it sort of grew the channel a little bit, but I think it also, I think it also showed people a little bit of my personality, and I, I really don't care too much for what people think um, about about me or my style or who I am yeah. as a human. As long as long as people don't have the right intentions, I'm decent and I'm a decent guy. That's that's all I really care about. So it sort of, I guess, it gave people an insight into me and and who I am. Yeah. So it kind yeah. of worked in many ways, man. Yeah. What's the next hairstyle? Bro, to be honest, it's all natural. I think the next one. Yeah. I think it's. I, th- I think it's just like I had a few friends, especially female friends that are like know their beauty and the hair stuff, and they're like, "You keep dying your hair; it's gonna fucking fall out." So like, <laughs> can you just chill? You've had it dyed three, four times in a month. Yeah. Um, just chill and like let it go natural again. So I think the fam's excited to see it go natural again, man. Mum's yeah. disgrace. She thinks I look forty <laughs> and. She said, oh, she, mom said you used to be good looking what happened. So I better go back, mate. When, when, when you're a six out of 10, you can't afford to lose points, mate. Exactly. I feel <laughs> <laughs> so back on serious note, what would be the 
your biggest challenge you've had thus far in life and how did you overcome that? Mate, I think I think probably aligned with my health, there was um fuck, I just hit the table there, the laptop had a shake. Um mate, probably yeah, probably aligned with my health, I guess. There was a, a period there in it's probably eighteen, nineteen. And I had sort of man, it's it's hard to explain for people who aren't medical professionals, but I have basically in my esophagus area, there's sort of some veins that fill up with a bit of bit too much blood sometimes because of the pressure in my liver and my spleen. And I sort of had a week, I was feeling really shit, man. I was supposed to go in for a surgery to get those veins taken away. And because if they fill up with too much blood, they can burst and then you're internally bleeding, which is obviously quite fatal. Um, So I was planning to go in for this surgery on the Friday and I've been feeling shit all week. And I rocked up that day at hospital and pre any surgery, they sort of do do a few checks, they check the blood pressure, your temperature, make sure you're doing well. And they were like, mate, I was coughing like a dog that day too. And they're like, mate, your bloody blood pressure is like 180 over 100. It's heart attack territory and your temperature is 39. And they're like, mate, you're crook. You need to go home. We can't operate on you yeah. and you're going to have to go in a hospital. And I was like, oh, okay. So I went home, but at the time, man, the hospital was just packed out. Like you couldn't get a bed. And they said to me, they said, I'll just go home and chill. And when we can get you a bed in the next like week, we'll let you know. And so I was sitting at home and I was waiting. It was was the next day and I didn't feel crash hot. Like I'd been coughing a lot and I coughed and I could taste like blood in my mouth. Yeah. So I went to the bathroom just quietly and I went to the sink and I just spat in the sink as gross as that is. And I was just like, it was just blood. And I probably coughed up like a good handful of blood. And I thought my initial thought was I've burst one of these vessels in my esophagus. And if I don't get the hospital to emergency ASAP, like I'm in big trouble. So I still remember I yelled out to my old boy and I was in pajamas, just chilling at home, having a, a movie down the lounge. And like, we just quickly raced to the hospital and man, I was freaking out. Cause like, I'd never experienced it before. It was probably the first time for me that I was like, shit, this is real. Like my health is actually affecting me. And we raced to the hospital and I still remember my mum and my sister used to work at the same place at the time. So I called them on the phone and my sister was on reception. She answered and I was like, look, you need to tell mum and get mum now. Like I'm coughing up blood and we're on our way to emergency. So I was freaking out, man, because you you always think the worst in those situations, you know, in the sort of in the moment. And we raced to the hospital and, and luckily sort of it had stopped being as aggressive and, um, the, the doctor said to me, they said, mate, you've got severe pneumonia in your lungs Shit. and your lungs are quite scarred and they're bleeding and you're, you're quite sick. So which for anyone with CF can be a real, real fucking knock around. So I ended up spending the next three and a bit weeks in hospital um, on 24 hour antibiotics. It made a loss, not like I lost nine kilos. I come out with the best rig. <laughs> I was, I was like, fuck, I wish I could keep the abs. Um, yeah. But I started eating again. But, um, but man, like it, it, it was probably the first time in my life that, you know, the, the 18 years prior to that I almost felt a little bit invincible, which maybe I started to take my health for granted. And like I said, you know, I'm not, I'm not a drinker. I'm not out. Like I'm not out. I don't, I don't get on drugs. Like I'm, I live a really clean lifestyle, but as someone with cystic fibrosis, I probably wasn't being as vigilant as I should have been. And for me, I, I sat there and I thought, fuck, I need to get my life back on track and focus again. And to be honest, man, it probably took me a couple of years to to do that. Um, I bounced back quickly, but I just continued to have a few hiccups. And like I said, it was that time in hospital last year where I realized I'm not doing the things that put me in the good position I am in today. Um, you know, the first 16 years of my life, you couldn't fault the work that I put in to be a healthy cystic fibrosis patient. Um, and, and that was part of the decision to leave my job as well was, um, without your health, you know, there's, man, there's a reminder that pops up on, on my phone every day and it just says without your health, you have nothing. So, um, it's, it's the true wealth as they say. So I'm looking forward to getting that back on track and I feel like I'm on the right path for that now. Yeah. So mate, that was probably the one, the one big test I think thus far. Mm. So what's the rest of this year look like for you? Just pumping out podcasts? Yeah, really, really good question again. Um, 
it's it's so weird, man. Because I thought I thought I'd be doing a little bit of traveling. Um, I was actually supposed to be in Spain at the moment with my whole family, yeah. so that's kind of a bit of a bummer. But I think everything happens for a reason, and it's actually turned out to be a really good time for me with the podcast, where I've got some great flow of guests. I've got. To be honest, man, I'm loving the Kiwis. The Kiwi guests are great. I've got yeah. Nate Nauer coming on this week. He's a probably one of the biggest radio personalities in New Zealand for the last decade who's now started a podcast, Run It Straight, on YouTube. Oh, yeah. He's had Joe Damon, Izzy Adesanya, Jordan River, um, some really cool guys on that show. Man, I'd, I'd, I'd love to travel a little bit towards the back end of this year for the podcast to actually connect face to face with some of the bigger guests. Yep. Um, I'd love to be in, in more positions like I am tonight on someone else's show yep. to, to share my story too. I think there's a lot of power, e- even on my podcast with the great guests that I've had my, my episode where I talk about my health and my life, which mind you, I think is the worst quality chat I've ever had because <laughs> I was so nervous because I knew yeah. my family was going to listen to it um, is one of the most popular because I think, there's power in your story when you're hosting a platform. So just doing more of this, man, and just getting my health back on track and getting life to a really good position and, and probably monetizing the podcast a little more and being a little more financial. Yeah. So, so it, it's going to be a good 2020, I think. Yeah. So quickly, where can people find you? Yeah. So the podcast name is The Bradley J. Driver Experience. Um, you can find it on Spotify or the Apple Podcast app. Um, as well as some of those face-to-face episodes on YouTube. I guess I say to everyone, though, the easiest way to do that all is just to head to my IG because it's all linked in my bio. Yep. So it's um, a little shameless plug here, mate. Bradley J. Driver. So it's D-R-Y-B-U-I-G-H. But mate, that's where I post all my stuff. And you know, every time I have a new episode going up, very much like yourself, I post that on IG and um, I'm pretty active on my stories and with a sort of stupid shit goes on there too. So it's, um, it's probably my mainstay. Yeah. Sweet. Well, thank you for coming on and giving me your time. I really appreciate it. Mate. Thank you so much for having me on. It's, it's awesome to see you in such a similar position to me as well. And man, you, you said before you, you're a bit of an introvert, but I think mate, it takes balls for anyone to get behind a mic and, and host someone and, um, mate, have a really well organized and, and classy show like you're doing. So credit to you. Cheers, mate. Appreciate it. No worries at all, brother.